Run, river, run, run through the hills. Run, river, run to the sea. Run, river, run to your place beneath the sun. Run, river, run over me. Run. Hi, this is Jan Lewis. Welcome to be my guest today. We have with us Michael Montigny, and I got that right. Okay, he is a Vietnam veteran. And as well as an author, and he wrote a great book called A Few Good Angels. You can zero in on this. Who designed the cover? It was Create Space with Amazon, mm -hmm. and uh, I had uh, put something together myself with a picture of me holding machine gun in the jungle, but he said it was too faded, so it wouldn't take, so they uh, took my idea and they put it in print. Uh, All right. Now, when did you write this, Michael? 2016. It took me three years to write it, uh, but 2016 it was published. But it took me uh, three years to to write the 56 stories. And uh, wow, that's. Did you think all along you would write a book? No, this uh, was that just, was not on my bucket list at all. This is okay. Now, for our vets out there, this is fantastic. You've got to read it. There'll be a copy downstairs in the library. But the thing that gets me is this was like a prophecy. This woman told your mother, right, that your youngest son would die in a foreign war. When I come, when I come home from a war in a foreign country, my mother had polio at the age of 16, and uh, she had nine brothers and sisters, and she just would watch them play. And my grandmother, uh, her mother, uh, felt bad for her and said, how can we entertain her? How can we... Yeah. make her feel good. Mm -hmm. And some neighbors said there was an elderly woman in the area that told fortunes. Now, who believes in fortunes? But the woman said, I'll come over and talk to her. Yeah. But she gave her five predictions. One was, uh, they told my mother, if you quit, if you give up something you love and pray every day, you will walk on your own. She gave up chocolate and she laid on the floor and did the sign of the cross and she walked on her own for four months. She said she would marry a man involved in law enforcement, my father was. You're going to have three children, two boys and a girl, she did. The oldest son would do well, he did. Um, your daughter will marry a man in uniform and have three children, two boys and a girl, she did. Your youngest son, I, won't see, I don't see him getting married, I'm married. I don't see him having any children, we have no children. And I don't see him coming home from a war in a foreign country. And the only way I heard this is by eavesdropping when you're a kid listening oh, to the... How old were you? Well, when I heard this stuff, I was just a young, I realized that I was the baby. I was the youngest. Yeah. And I guess I, I thought of it. I said, it's me. Yeah. And I would hear my mother say, uh, everything has come true. We can't let Mikey at the time join the military. Oh my God. But they didn't realize it was going to be a draft. So oh, I got yeah. drafted in the Army and I joined the Marines. And I asked her the question. She says, no, no, that's not true. That you're supposed to die in a foreign country. Yeah. But the second prophecy is yeah. the gunnery sergeant. When I became a machine gunner, you go to machine gun school in Camp Lejeune in North Carolina, and 21 of us graduated, yeah. and he had us stand in a circle, and he stood right in the middle of us, and he looked at us, and he just says, take a good look at each other, because half of you are not coming home. Yeah. Uh, the rest of you are going to be seriously wounded or commit suicide. Yeah. And like an idiot, at 19 years old, yeah. I said to him, I said, that's a hell of a pep talk. Oh. <laughs> and he grabbed me right by the throat put me against the wall and he said, I just want you to understand you have the most dangerous job in the infantry. Life expectancy of a machine gunner in combat is 15 minutes. And all of us, our jaws dropped. And we, I wish they would have told us that before we went to machine gun school. Yeah. But they didn't. And so I, I knew that there were two things. One, I may not come home at all. And another one, I may come home and, and you know. He mentioned wounded. committing suicide. Committing suicide was part of it. You were 19. What made you choose the Marines? <laughs> They're the toughest, I think, of all. Well, my, my brother-in-law was the heavyweight boxing champion of the Marine Corps. And uh, when he m married my sister and dated, and he came over and addressed blues and the way he looked and all that, he always impressed me. Yeah. And so I said that maybe one day that's what I want to do, too. Yeah. And uh, I was a good athlete at the time, so I made it through the physical part of it, you know, pretty yeah. well. Yeah, yeah. But... Uh, the rest of it is not easy. I don't care who you are. Was it? Did you go to? Paris is it Camp Island. Lejeune first? No, you go to Paris Island. Oh, Luke it's camp. not Paris, I hear. When you when you show up at the gate, there's a sign on the right. As you pull up in a bus, uh, it says "Welcome to Hell." Yeah. And it is. Uh, back then, they could lay a hand on you, so they could beat us up, kick us, do whatever they wanted to. Today, they can't do that. They can't do for that. some time. Uh, but they did it for a reason, just to see if you could take it. 
And that's why they say the few, the proud, because there aren't many that make it. And uh, so when you come home, you feel very proud that you uh, were able to complete the training and all that. Mm -hmm. And um, we do have a brotherhood mm -hmm. amongst ourselves. That's why you always hear us say Sampe Fai, which means always faithful, Sampe. but we always have each other's back. Yeah. No matter where or who it is. What year were you in? I think it was 1965 to 71. I, I joined the Marines unknowingly on the Marine Corps birthday. Oh. And I did not know November 10th was the Marine Corps birthday. So that was even more, uh, uh, I, uh, you know, waking me up when I got there to yeah. prove to us how important that day was. Uh -oh. So I went on November 10th and I got out uh, 1971. That's a long haul. Well, you only spend, I spent two years on, on active duty. Yeah. If you go to combat and you go on active duty, you only have to spend two years in active, then you spend the other four years in inactive. And so I didn't really have to go to reserve meetings or anything because That's of the right. combat experience and where I was stationed, too. Where in Vietnam? Were you right in the center of the action? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, I was at Red Beach, and there's a specific reason for that name. Um, and after five months... There, my life was already saved uh, at least six times. Uh, actually, my life was saved the second day I was there. Yeah. But we're there six months, and then our company commander came over to us and said, saddle up, mm -hmm. which means get your gear together. Mm -hmm. We're moving out a uh, contingency of Green Berets. We're overrun up north, and we're the only ones that can go and reinforce them. And yeah. we had no idea where we were going. Yeah. And a half an hour before we landed, it was the place is called Quezon. And so... Uh, when you read about that, you heard about it, it was it was very bad. And so we went there, and uh, I lived in a hole in the ground. Literally. From, well, that's your that's your home, you, yeah. your foxhole, but over there you have a hole, and you put little holes inside that hole to put your sea rations and other gear sure. that you have. Yeah. You sleep outside the hole, you go on patrols during the day, ambushes during the night, and um, then I went on helicopter missions, uh, rescue missions to save Marines trapped in certain valleys and stuff, and then I went on long-range patrols uh, where you go off for three days or so. That's uh, a long... My, I can't imagine. I know when I was in college, it was just at the end of a lot of the Vietnam, and it didn't hit a lot of us kids about the Vietnam, the severe seriousness of it. I thought, there was a boy I liked, yeah. and when it suddenly... That's what it hit me, whatever it takes. Oh, my God, he may have to go. And it just sort of hits like a ton of bricks. You mm -hmm. realize, my God... And that person might not come back. Well, I was 19 years old. Yeah. I had a job. I had a car. I was saving to go to college to play baseball. I was a good ball player. Yeah. My parents couldn't afford college at all. And we were all pretty poor. And uh, that was just, uh, uh, that would pretty much line you up to go to Vietnam. Yeah. If you came from a family, didn't have much money. And yeah. so um, that's what I explained to the kids in high school, that I was 19 years old and I had all this. And four months later, I'm a professional killer. And that's not what I wanted. I, I never was on a, a, a train, a ship, or a plane. A bus would be uh, high school because I played football, basketball, and baseball yeah. and going to different high schools. But I try to explain to them that's not what we wanted. You know, but what are you going to do? I wasn't going to run away to Canada or anything like that. <laughs> oh. I wasn't going to embarrass my family, my, my parents, or myself. So I, I did it. We're talking with Michael Montigny. I got it right. Beautiful name. And he is a Vietnam veteran and an author who wrote this terrific book, A Few Good Angels, guys out there and girls too. You want to hear it right <laughs> with the way it was, you've got to check this out. There is, I love your table of contents. I love it when somebody is precise. The angel assigned, we talked about the angel assigned at birth. What was the induction station like? Well, the induction station, um, I actually tried to get in the Navy, yeah. and they said that I had a hot murmur. And they said I had a perforated eardrum, so I probably wouldn't have been able to make the Navy. So my cousin, he went in the Navy, and I said, you know, I'll see what happens. So I got drafted in the Army. You go to the induction station. Yeah. And then I was selected, uh, six of us were selected for the Marine Corps. And it said either you get, get on that bus uh, and go to Fort Dix, or you join the Marine Corps for two years active duty. But wouldn't your ear and heart problem matter in the Marines too? Well, one of the stories, what it said was the gunnery sergeant that I told that to, he looked at my paperwork and saying, after a couple of runs around the parade deck at, at Paris Island, uh, we'll get rid of your hot murmur. <laughs> oh! So he ripped up the paperwork, and uh, that was it. Yeah, but now they couldn't do that nowadays, could they? No. No. There's a lot they couldn't do, but... Uh, 
we only went through Paris Island for eight weeks. Uh, now, uh, after, it's like 13 weeks. Yeah. But they made us go through and get us out real quick. And then you go to Camp Lejeune for advanced infantry training yeah. and machine gun school. Then you go to Camp Pendleton for jungle warfare training, which isn't a lot of fun. And the worst one was prison of war training and conducted by British Royal Marines where they actually torture you. You were tortured? Yes. Is that the... the, the, the uh, my brother was in the Marines... And uh, he wasn't listening. Evidently, as the story goes, the gas chamber thing, the, the, D, the DA, the drill instructor, DI, told him, do not take that mask off until I tell you to. Correct. He went in there and went, and they had to, they had to carry him out. Yeah. Did you go through that? Everybody has to go through oh. it. Well, oh. the drill instructor don't wear a mask. He goes in and he's talking to you. And you're how saying, can, how can he talk to you with the gas? They're so used to it or how they hold their breath or whatever, but he just said, now you can take your mask up, not take a deep breath, and you swear to God, your lungs are going to explode. And uh, they just wanted you to understand what it was like, what you had to do, make sure you put the mask on correctly. Yeah. And uh, we never had to put mask on all the time we were there. That would have been different countries. That's scary stuff. Well, the prison of war training, that's another thing they add to it, because they, they told us if you're captured, which Marines, uh, we don't surrender. No. So we're supposed to fight to the death. So that's something else you already have on your list of things that you have to do. But uh, if you're captured by the Viet Cong and you're going to be captured, they said to leave one round in the chamber and kill yourself because they will torture you so bad that you don't want that. If the North Vietnamese capture you, you've got a chance of going to a prison camp. So you've got a better chance of living. There's no guarantees, but you've got a better chance. Yeah. So you have that on your mind as well. Um, yeah. So it's, uh, I mean, you, you grow up pretty fast because you're 19 years old. And when I saw the Marines going home, the Marine that gave me this ring yeah. before he left, um, they looked like hell. They looked dehydrated. They didn't smile. He's going home. All these guys are going home. Now, one of them smiled or said hello or anything. They just stared at you and looked Exhausted, right through Exhausted, bro. Just and they just boarded the plane. And we all looked at each other and we said, what did they see? You know, where did they come from? It scared us just to look at these guys. Michael, how can, before we go any further, how can people get a hold of your book? On uh, Amazon, Amazon.com, it's available. Uh, I also have a website, www.afewgoodangels.com. They have other stories that I've written there. It has pictures, it has the interviews of me on television uh, at Veterans Day, and it also has the uh, times that I, that I talk to seniors at uh, their high schools regarding history. Um, which a lot of them, uh, when we say to them, uh, a general would be with us, mm -hmm. and he would say, who knows where Vietnam is? They would get up and point to something in Europe. They didn't even know what Vietnam was. And oh. then I had one young man say that he couldn't wait. I said, anybody have any questions? He said, no, I have a comment. He said, I can't wait to get into combat. Oh. And I said, son, oh, no, no, no. I, I said, if you ever get into combat, I said, first you'd ask for your mother, then second, you're going to poop in your pants. Yeah. And, he, and everybody laughed at him, but I was trying to explain, you play in too many video games. Exactly. Is it true they say, the old saying, there are no atheists in a foxhole? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I told people that. Um, <laughs> there's a story in there about the, yeah. the gentleman that... I wanted you to share that. ...didn't believe yeah. in God, didn't believe in anything. Yeah. And I told him, when we are in combat, I guarantee you, you're going to pray. Yeah. And uh, he said, he was so big and strong that he never felt that somebody could kill him in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Yeah. But he died, um, his boat, he was on a river boat, the boat was blown up, and he had heavy gear on, and he sank to the bottom, and he died, he drowned. But we were all told to go to the shore, and uh, we threw out some flowers or something we had or whatever, and we said a prayer for him. And that day, it was just like it is today, uh, there was no clouds at all, and then all of a sudden, one black cloud appeared over us, and it's about 110 degrees out there, we're sweating profusely, and it starts pouring. And we look around, there's a black cloud right over our head. Oh, you got you guys. <laughs> and it was, uh, it didn't move. Yeah. And we said, what is that? And uh, so yeah. I said, it's probably a signal to me that, you know, you were right. <laughs> How cool is that? It was, we, we looked at each other, couldn't believe what was happening. Yeah. We were being cooled down from that one cloud in the shower for us while we stood on the yeah. edge of the beach praying for him. So it's that was a, amazing. Now, we've got, what, what is, the, tell them about the elephant platoon. Well... <laughs> When you first arrived, um, you go through all types of training from the time you get up until the time you go to bed. And they select me and a friend of mine, Roosevelt Benton, that went to Central High. We went in together. And I was 205 pounds of muscle. He was 225 pounds of muscle. 
and they said, you two guys have been selected for a special um, special branch of the Marines. Yeah, yeah. So I wrote home saying, gee, I've only been there a, a few days, and already I'm selected for special a special branch, yeah. um, like special forces or whatever, or recon, I thought. I didn't know. And all of a sudden, they put us on the bus, and there's other Marines there, recruits, and they are gigantic. Yeah. They were drafted, but some of these guys had to be 250, 300 or more. And we just looked at each other and said, where are we going? Yeah. And we pull up at this barracks, and there's an elephant on the guide on the flag. <laughs> and the drill instructors get on board and said, welcome to Elephant Platoon, you fat. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's what it was like. Yeah. That, <laughs> oh. so, so they trained us and all that. and yeah. Not trained us. They made us do a very rigorous uh, exercise to lose weight. But then the doctor came in to examine yeah. everyone. He saw me and Roosevelt, and I got veins popping out of my arms yeah. and shoulders, and I was well built. He said, what are you doing here, and yeah. what is Roosevelt doing here? And we found out the corpsman thought that anybody over 200 pounds had to go to Elephant Platoon. Which is wrong, I know. So you go back to Paris Island, and then our drill instructor knew that we were selecting it correctly. He said, if you can catch up to where we are now, you're okay. If you can't, you've got to start all over again. So all Not the other, cool. all the other uh, recruits helped us uh, learn what we missed while we were away. Michael, let's skip around a little bit. This is, uh, he's got the chapters beautifully listed. Again, A Few Good Angels by Michael Montigny. And uh, he is sharing with you the real experience he went through in Vietnam. It's pretty uh, intense. My first guardian angel. What was that? Well, as the story goes, I was born at home. Yeah. Uh, it was there in a rainstorm and the doctor had to come to the house and he went to my father after working with my mother and said um, you have to make a decision it's either your baby or your wife because uh -huh. i was a breech barrette and the umbilical cord was wrapped around my neck yeah and then my they said my father uh, went into shock and one of my mother's sisters hollered out his feet my feet were coming out. I make a joke of it. I said I slid home and I was okay. Yep. Um, but that was the first time uh, that I... But your mother was okay. My mother was okay. Yeah. Uh, but I was I was 10 pounds and she's only, she was only 4 foot 10. Whoa. And so... Uh, you were healthy. Oh, yeah. But anyways, I made it through that. And then uh, my father saved my life um, at the shore of the beach. I got kicked in the head when I was 4 years old. I was passed out in a dead man's float. My father picked me up and pumped the uh, water out of my body saved my life. Um, I almost hung myself helping my father put up um, a clothesline. I was going to surprise him. My mother called us in for, for dinner, and I said, I'll finish this on my own. I, I, I stood <laughs> yeah. on a ladder yeah. and or a chair, and I slipped, and the rope went right around my neck, and I was hanging there. How old were you? Choking to death. I was about six. I was choking yeah. to death, and all of a sudden, the rope just let go. And why? And I went in the house, my neck was swollen, and I had a red marker on my neck. And they said, what happened to your neck? And I told them. Yeah. And he said, you're stupid, you know, doing yeah. something like that. Yeah. I just wanted to prove I could do something for him. You're lucky to be here. Oh, there's... <laughs> Big time. This stuff, my wife can tell you, since I've been home, people ask the question, are the angels still with you? Oh, yeah. I survived cancer in 1994 where the doctor said if it was, mal it was malignant, but he said if it spread, I had about 5% chance of living. And it capsulized. It never spread. And I was I survived a head-on collision doing 60 miles an hour where a woman went through a stop sign and came right at me, and I hit her. And when the jaws of life, when they came to the jaws of life, they're looking for the body. And I said, I'm right here. And they said, no way. Oh, they said, there's no way anybody can survive this. Uh, you should be dead. Did you have chemo and radiation with the cancer? No, just radiation. I had the radiation. Yeah, I've had that long ago. I'm going to tell you, that's a trip. Oh, yeah. But I think chemo is supposedly worse. What do you yeah. think? I don't know. Yeah, I didn't have that, but everybody they know, uh, seeing what they go through. How long ago did you have to go through that? 94. Oh, not too long ago. 94, I, I had um, 25 radiation. Um, yeah. And then uh, after that, he said, whatever it is, he says it capsulized, and he says you're okay. Right. After all you've been through, Vietnam, cancer survivor, Somebody hitting you at 60 miles an hour. 60 miles an hour. Jaws of life, they thought they were taking a corpse out, and you were like, I'm here. I actually went across the street to try to help the other two people. After they got you out? And they didn't get me out. I kicked my way out of the car myself. They were looking for the body inside. I was standing outside the car. Do you think it's your marine training? 
I didn't have a seat belt on, but back then many of us didn't, yeah. and I don't know if that saved my life. And then uh, I actually went and played golf later on. That same day? Same day. <laughs> my wife didn't know that. You're tough. She heard that I got in an accident. She yeah. didn't know how bad it was, and she took me to the hospital anyways to be looked at, and the doctor said, do you know you have glass stuck in your head? And because my hair was so thick and whatever, yeah. I had yeah. three pieces of glass stuck in my head, uh, probably about an inch in... Uh, he had to take it out. He took it out, and then the next day, I was in shock. I didn't realize it. Yeah. The next day, my arm, I, I had trouble moving my arm. I lost my bicep later on. But uh, We are talking of the amazing one. Oh my God, Michael, Ma, I will get this. Michael Montigny. And Michael wrote this great book. It is called A Few Good Angels. Catch a copy of it downstairs in the library. Michael, where else can they get this? You can get it at Amazon.com. Uh, also, you can go to my website and you will see other stories that I have written and also uh, uh, past uh, television interviews and uh, radio interviews and also um, a YouTube uh, video. Tell us about Roosevelt Benton. Roosevelt played football for Central High. I played football for Westward. Now you're talking about Rhode Island. Rhode Island. Cent Central, was that in Providence? Yes, it is. Okay, all right. And uh, I was a pretty good uh, football player, and I had taken him out at least three or four times in a row, yeah. blocking him out, and uh, he got upset after one of the plays and blindsided me and cracked my ribs. I had three Ooh. ribs cracked. Another thing you've lived through. Yeah. And so when we ended up getting uh, to the induction station, he had Central High jacket on. I had West Warwick High on. He looked at me, he goes, Montigny? I go, Benton? Like that. I said, you're the son of a bee that cracked my ribs. He says, well, you kept on taking me out. He said, you, you got me upset. Oh we became best friends. Yeah, you were best friends after we that. We went through all the training together. And uh, uh, in machine gun school, which he went through as well, yeah. uh, we had 21, uh, 21 in the school. There were uh, 17 African Americans. Um, there were three uh, Caucasians and one uh, Cherokee Indian, so uh, I would be picked on. You would be, yeah, a lot. And right. he would come over and just say, "He's my best friend. You know, leave him alone, yeah. or I'll kick your butt." And he would. And they learned to realize that I wasn't a bad guy. No, you know where we come from in Rhode Island. Um, I didn't even know about any kind of uh, racial issues or anything like that. We never had a problem, and I was just surprised. Yeah. But we became best friends because when you go through training and you go into Vietnam, I mean, you sleep next to each other, yep. you have each other's back, you don't look at color, mm -mm. Uh, you don't even think about it. No. And I would take a bullet for any one of them, they would take a bullet for any one of, uh, no, for me. And uh, Michael, what was your first, fo my first foxhole, what was that all about? That was the first time my life was saved. Uh, it was the second day I was there. Yeah. We were told that we had to get two men in each foxhole and we had to protect this village. They said that it, they had word that it was going to be attacked at night. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, we had an SO fuel dump that we had to protect at the same time. So I'm walking over to the foxholes, and there's two men in the first three. Yeah. And I see one, next one, like the fourth and just one man. So I went to get in, and all of a sudden I hear a voice a few foxholes away. He says, Monty, that was my nickname, Monty, over here. And it was a guy that I went to Paris Island with. Yeah. So I just said, I'm sorry, it's a friend of mine. I get in there, and during the night, we heard some movement, something happening. Mm. So we shot some flares up in the air to identify what was going on. This young man, we found out it was his first day. Oh. He panicked, yeah. pulls out a hand grenade, oh. which you're not supposed to do. No. He pulls the pin. He drops it. You only have three seconds yeah. to throw that grenade. The other Marine that would have been me hollered out grenade and tried to ju jump out of the hole, and he was hit. Uh, the Marine that dropped the grenade was killed, and the other Marine that would have been me was wounded in the back of his head, his back, and his legs. Yeah. So I probably would have been sent home uh, my second day because he was pretty bad. But he was conscious enough to tell us what happened, that he dropped the grenade. He, he not only dropped the grenade, he dropped it into a box of grenades. Great. So, so they all went up, right? Went up. No? So all we heard was the <laughs> muffled explosion yeah. and all this stuff flying, and then... That was it. That was it. But if I would have gotten in the hole with him, that would have been me. You have dodged the bullet how many times? Have you counted it? Yes. Well, 12 that I'm aware of in Vietnam, and then twice at Camp Lejeune. Um, but then sometimes I think, and I say, there are times like a caisson, a helicopter blew up, 
and we couldn't see because it was real foggy. Sure. And I moved to the right, and the blade of the helicopter came right by, like that, and almost hit me in the shoulder. And if I would have stayed where I was, I would have been hit directly. It's like you have a cross, a red, a red mark all over you, like hit me. You know? But I wasn't alone. I was with other Marines, but yeah. we couldn't see what was happening. We didn't know if we had to run over and try to rescue people. Yeah. And we found out they all jumped out of the helicopter just before it blew. Oh, but when it blew, the blade came off and just went down like this. Almost got you, right? Over here on the side, because the thing went right by us and just kept on going the runway. Yeah. And so uh, luckily we moved to the right. But When you see MASH on TV... A lot of people, that's all they can think of. Was it anything like that, the way it was set up? Uh, no. Wow. No, we, I washed up three times at Quezon. I washed up, took a bath, and I mean a bath. I got in a stream or a pond mm -hmm. while you're on patrol. You couldn't just stand up and try to take a shower. Where's the shower? Yeah. So all you had was a 55-gallon drum of rainwater full of bugs. And then, oh. You take your helmet, you yeah. take your helmet, and you clear the bugs out, and then use that yeah. to wash yourself, brush your teeth, and that's it. That's it. So, I my my body changed color. It changed to like a red clay color because it would get into your pores. Yeah. But all you had was a, a washcloth and a small towel. And a, and a helmet. To, to did clean. you have any privacy at all? No, you did it right outside. We were all the guys? Uh, uh, that wouldn't go with the girls too well. Well, there's not my, well, <laughs> I'd be private bed. It ain't, that, it ain't that I'm against it. I just don't see sometimes uh, uh, what a woman going to do in that situation. Yeah. You know, and I felt bad. I just, when I hear about that, I'm saying, based on what I had to go through, I, I, I wouldn't want to see anybody go through that. But that was it. People didn't realize that that was part of your daily thing. Michael, what was the standing ovation in the jungle? Well, we had to go on a three-day long-range patrol, mm -hmm. and we didn't have, uh, all we had is one canteen of water. Mm -hmm. And as we're going out, uh, I'm carrying the machine gun, which is 23 pounds, and then I have bandoliers of, of machine gun rounds, and I have a 45 caliber, I have other stuff, I have a flag jacket. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's all pretty heavy. And usually, after you walk so long, you share it with somebody else. Yeah. And uh, we ran out of water because you have to test the water. The Viet Cong would poison it. And they would do certain things to it yeah. to, uh, so that you had to test the water. If it changed a certain color on this litmus paper, it would tell you that it's no good. So See, every, most of us wouldn't have a clue about that. Well, we had to do that. You dip it and all that, and you had to check it out. And everywhere we found water, it was contaminated. So um, we had to wait for water to come in. I didn't let anybody carry that machine gun. Yeah. And you're supposed to trade it off. And everybody else was exhausted enough that for me, to, and that was pretty strong, sure. but to just give it to somebody else and say, here, I can't carry it anymore, I said no. So I carried it for three days, which I didn't realize was unheard of. Yeah. Nobody did that. Yeah. And so when I walked in, the guys that were up front uh, were telling everybody, you know, Monty carried the gun the whole time. Yeah. I, didn't, I didn't know anything about that, that yeah. that was such a big deal. Everybody cheered me on or saluted me and, and said, what the hell did I do? Yeah. And they told me after, you're the first Marine to carry the gun for three days solid without sharing it with anybody. My shoulder was sore for about a month, but that's nothing else. <laughs> Your body, you have taken more of a beating than anyone I think I've ever talked to. We interviewed a, um, a veteran, a wonderful gentleman here in, in Upton. Um, he was a tank gunner. Oh, yeah. And they, I guess the lifespan of a tank gunner isn't the greatest either. <laughs> no. But he made it. Machine gunners, uh, like I said, 15 minutes. And I checked, I Googled that. Because I remember him saying that, but I never had any way of proving that. A lot of the 21 guys, though, that I went over, they either were killed or were seriously wounded. So there was knowledge of that, that quite a few got, didn't make it back the, you know, as a whole body. But uh, I checked. World War II was 25 minutes uh, during World War II. So there was a number that they put in. But I found out second lieutenants uh, were also very vulnerable. You couldn't wear a 45. Uh, yeah. Because the enemy would know that you're an officer. Yeah, he was World gunner. War II. Yeah, he's and older now, than you are. Yeah. Now, Vietnam, yeah. we tell people, you know, take your gold bars off and your silver bars off. Sure. Uh, and here I am trying to teach them yeah. that we're going to keep you alive. And they wanted to prove they're an officer. They said, no, uh, yeah. by the time you get out there, you're going to have a bullet in your head. Yeah. So we trained them before they went out in the jungle. So the enemy knew by looking at the fruit salad on your, your shoulder. Well, it just, you, you have a... 
you have a gold bar, a silver bar, or whatever for the officers. Yeah. And then we had sergeants or corporals. Yeah. We took that off. We knew who was in charge. Yeah. You didn't have to wear anything. Yeah. If you wore a forty-five, that meant you were an officer, a machine gunner, a radio operator, or a corpsman. Mm -hmm. So any one of them, the enemy would want to kill. If you get, although we all knew how to operate the radio, which they don't realize that. Yeah. So they would shoot the radio operator so you can't call for help, and then they would kill the corpsman so he can't help anybody. And then the lieutenant, who they thought would be running, you know, yeah. the patrol, but he, and then uh, the machine gunner. See, my weapon fired 650 rounds a minute, and it was very powerful. So yeah. if they could take me out, then they had a chance of winning that firefight. Yeah. So that's when we found out after the life expectancy wasn't long. But they didn't dare telling us that when we first got there. Um, we got one. We we're going to run out of time, but to tiny enemy that that's adorable. When was the, what was the tiny enemy? It was the mosquitoes. Yep. Wherever okay. you went, I don't care where you were. Yeah. You had to if you went on an ambush, they would be biting you. Yeah. Now the way we're trained, you can't slap yourself. Why? You make a sound. Oh. So okay. you try to blow it off each other. You do that. Yeah. Or try to do this, but you couldn't slap your face or slap yourself because you're making a sound. Yeah. So when you go in an ambush, you are concealed and you're waiting for the enemy to come. But these things are all over you all night long. You have snakes crawling over oh, you. Oh, the snake you would lizards. go. No, but I mean, Ugh. you can't move. How did you get rid of a snake? You just sit still. <laughs> were they poisonous? You don't know. Some of them, most of them were, but yeah. you don't know. But you would always. Um, Prepare yourself for that. So if a snake came by you, you would just let the thing just crawl up. You didn't make any motion or try to do anything. And uh, you would have to sit there for hours and just wait until the daylight. But the mosquitoes, they gave us a mosquito repellent. Unfortunately, if you shaved mm -hmm. and then you sprayed the stuff on you, it was like somebody just burned you with acid. It, that stuff was terrible. Michael, you are a walking miracle. We're going to close now, but again, <clears throat> Michael McDigny, and he is the author of A Few Good Angels, not A Few Good Men, Angels. And uh, again, before we close, how can they get a hold of your book, Michael? You can obtain the book on Amazon.com. Uh, they also have 32 reviews that uh, readers have put there, and some of them are Marines. And uh, one of the Marines that put down uh, that is probably the best book he ever read about Vietnam and about the Marines. Uh, you also can go to my website, uh, www.afewgoodangels.com. And don't forget to look downstairs in the Upton Library. If you're watching out in Rhode Island, come on up to Upton. <laughs> We've got it. We're going to have a copy down there. Before we close, are you appearing anywhere? No, locally or around? Not right now. I just appeared last week at, at the Coesan Inn for the Rotary Club. And just before that, I did uh, a high school. Mm -hmm. So. Very good. Thanks. For, oh. Thank you for inviting me. You sure me. enlightened me with a lot of things uh, in this book. If you don't really understand the Vietnam situation, Michael will really set you straight. It's a great book. I hope a lot of the... I've got a kid, a millennial kid, right? I hope to have him read this. Yes. You know, because I think a lot of the guys think, oh, nothing to it. I, I, <laughs> oh, you I, know. I think everybody should read it. Yeah. Because the they'll, girls too? they'll have more respect for veterans. They'll have more respect. And I always end with this, that no matter how old we are, mm. Every veteran would still bear arms and protect their country and their family and friends, and that is a fact. So, <sighs> what do you say after that? That's just, thank you so much for being with. Thank you. Do you have another book on the on the horizon, or is this it? I'm just writing stories right now. Uh, it takes a lot of time to do it. Yeah. And so you're not retired yet, are you? Yeah, I retired ten years. I'm 73. But what? I, I, yes, I retired ten years ago, and uh, I worked for a company for 45 years. And uh, as a, in human resources, so I used to help veterans in human resources as well, and I try to help veterans now. That's um, pretty good, Michael. Thanks for being with us. Thank you very much. And we'll see you next it's time. I'll be my guest. Thank you.